Okay, here we go. I'm with my friend Ross Harper. Hey, Ross, how you doing? Hey, I'm good. Peace. Uh, so, uh, Ross, you got a new album out. Tell us a bit about the album. Right. Well, the Dark Album. The Dark Album is a culmination of about seven years of introspective um, music production, uh, which which I released in October last year. And it was um, released to critical acclaim by um, Mix Mag, uh, front page of Mix Mag, front page of Decoded Mag. Richie Horton, the techno pioneer, was playing tracks from it. Charlotte DeWitt, the um, figurehead of the techno move, modern techno movement, called it beautiful. Um, so yeah, I was um, I was blown away by the reception. This album. It must. It must have been an absolute. It must have been an absolute buzz. <sighs> Absolutely, yeah. I, I mean, you know, I was there sitting on my yoga mat, um, getting messages. You know, Richie Horton has played the track in this venue, and Richie Horton has played the track in that venue. <laughs> and I'm like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> That is absolutely brilliant. And um, you've had some remixes out just this week or last week? Yeah, so Tuesday just gone, 28th of Feb. Um, I yeah, I had the first batch of remixes out. And um, I, I've, I've never really been that sure about remixes. You know, like, I, I, as a DJ, actually, I know remixes. There are some beautiful remixes. Um, but I'm quite... As I mentioned, there's this introspective part of me, very personal part of me, and so I've been quite um, uh, guarded about allowing people to remix my music in the past. You know, I've been releasing music since 2008, something like that, and I've had tracks played by, um, uh, I've had tracks played on the Depeche Mode World Tour when they did the Delta Machine World Tour. Uh, Martin L. Gore liked one of my very deep introspective tra techno tracks and he plays a DJ set before every uh, performance. So literally one of my tracks was played at every uh, stadium in the whole world. So I, I, I'm, no, I'm no stranger to success for my music, but I've been very guarded about allowing people to uh, get their hands on it and remix it. But for this, this just felt like the right time uh, uh, where um, where things were really starting to unfold for me, and so it felt like the right time to allow other artists to remix my music. And uh, oh. and how did it feel once you'd made that decision? <laughs> it's fantastic. Uh, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Uh, like, wow, some of the stuff that's being sent to me by some of these artists is just like. I'm bouncing off the walls listening to it. And, you know, some of it no one's heard other than me. Some of it I played in some of my live shows and I've got some unreleased videos of me playing the tracks and people going absolutely bonkers to them. Um, so they'll be, they'll be released on social media soon-ish. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been wild. And there's still more to come. Yeah. It's, yeah. Wonderful. That's so good. So we're going to talk a bit about your uh, music library. Uh, so I usually like to start at the beginning um, mm. with uh, sort of music discovery and where you find your music and, um, you know, how you create your own uh, sort of uh, playlist for uh, listening to and finding new music to, um, to play out and that sort of thing. OK, so I mentioned that I've been in the scene a while. I mean, I've actually I actually started promoting techno parties in the late nineties. And, um, and that, that I enjoyed doing that, but I was still hungry for more. I wanted more. So I started DJing and I was like, this, this isn't doing it for me, you know, DJing, you know, I want more. So then I was like, right, stop everything. I'm going to music college. And I did five years of music college learning digital music production, just at the advent of the, in the box production. So, when hardware studios were just um, moving away. Fast forward to kind of like 2007, 2008, I graduated and I was like, right, okay, now we have the digital revolution. Beatport, I remember when Beatport launched, I was sitting 
in my uh, college library because they had a uh, super fast internet connection. I can't remember, was it something like a DSN line or something? So this was in the age of dial-up, but everyone else had dial-up, but big businesses and, and educational establishments had super fast internet. And America had already broken the mold and got super fast internet sorted. And then suddenly it was like someone said Beatport to me and I found Beatport and I was like, I, I remember it was like an epiphany. I was like, this is it. Everything's changed right now. Right now, everything has changed. And, and then I did like Beatport record shopping for quite a while. But during that time, I started my own label and my name was starting to get out there into the techno sphere. And um, people were starting to send me promos. People were starting to add me to promo pools. So I actually then stopped listening to other people's music around 2012. I was like, I'm, I need to isolate myself from the scene. And it was to do with how I was feeling inside. And when I was listening to other people's music, I was feeling all these emotions of not being good enough myself and wanting to sound like someone else and really liking the way other people sounded and then feeling that my sound wasn't going to work with that. Or there was just a lot of negative emotions coming up listening to other people's music. So I literally drew a line on it and stopped record shopping, stopped listening to promos. The only music I would listen to was music that I released on my own label. And that mainly was a kind of very introverted, hypnotic techno sound, which is now very fashionable, but back then wasn't. Um, and um, yeah, and then it was only recently, well, I say recently, around 2018, uh, after writing hundreds of my own tracks, not listening to anyone else's music, there's like now a, like a, a vast plethora of unreleased tracks that I've written. But I then, in 2018, um, felt like I'd somehow uh, been through this introverted journey and I was now in a place where I was ready to embrace the scene again. And that was when I started a radio show called House and Techno with Heart and Soul. And I started to um, start listening to all these promos that were being sent to me. So I was like... Um, yeah, so I, I, I mainly listen to new and unreleased music from various sources. Uh, if there's an art, it, from, from that experience, if there's an artist that I pick up as someone who um, is resonating with me, I'll then dive deeper into their catalogue on, on Beatport. Or, um, yeah, yeah, Juno is another source, and they're British. And so if I can buy from Juno, than I do because that's supporting British industry. And um, uh, so, uh, so you, so you'll download your tracks from Beatport or Juno. But before you get there, are you curating those playlists in Spotify or YouTube, or how do you sort of bring together yeah, the music okay. that you're listening to? I mean, I do to? have Spotify. I do have Spotify, and it is, it is. But I, actually, I don't. I don't use Spotify as a artist discovery tool. Um, occasionally I'll allow the algorithm to suggest stuff to me. And occasionally I'll allow SoundCloud algorithm to suggest stuff to me. But on the whole, it's new music through promo agencies that, that I'm latching onto. And I then create, I, I have a playlist, a uh, public playlist on Spotify. I have the house and techno with heart and soul playlist which is mainly tracks that i've aired on my radio show and i've just created a new new playlist which is the dark album world tour playlist which is tracks that will have um been on the radio show so tracks you know to get on my radio show the track has to be really really good right like i i'm very fastidious about my selection of music and I won't just skip through tracks and select the ones that I like the little bits of if if I find a track that I like the sound of I will then listen to the whole track to make sure that I like all of it and if there are parts of it that I don't like I make sure I know where they are so when I'm mixing it I can avoid those parts of the track and 
those are the tracks that might make it onto the radio show to then make it onto something that I'd play in front of people face to face. That's the tracks that will end up on the dark album world tour playlist. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty brutal. I'm not brutal about much in this life, right? Like I'm really like a really kind of open hearted kind of guy, but when it comes to what music makes it onto my playlist, I'm, yeah, really. And of course, when you get to that place where you're getting sent lots of music, um, actually, you do need to be quite selective about what you're going to listen to and who it's come from. And, you know, there's only a certain amount of time in the day, right? You know, before all of this digital stuff, which is amazing, like I absolutely embrace the digital revolution. I saw a post on Facebook uh, just last week. Someone said, we are living in a age of musical creative epiphany or something you know like and then like there was like a hundred haters who were like no we're not this is the worst age of music ever you know and i was like no he's absolutely right you know because there is so many people around the world making music right now yes a lot of it is awful because they're they can just self-release and they can just send it to you through soundcloud and they've only been making music for but some of it is incredible, even if they've been producing just for six months. Some of it is like, there's some artists I'm just like blown away by. And so, yeah, I fully support the, the digital revolution. But going back to your question, there was a time when you'd go into a record shop and the guy who worked behind the counter would know you, right, or girl. It was mainly guys back then, but they could, there were girls. And they would be like, oh, it's Ross. I know the kind of stuff Ross likes. Here's a pile of 30 vinyls. You go and listen to them, you know, and, and I, I would do that. I would, you know, fastidiously sit there for an afternoon. You know, a lot of them were like, this guy's nuts. He's, he's been here all afternoon. Like most, most people, most punters would come in and give them <laughs> a few vinyl. They would listen to them, skip through, and then they'll be out within like five or 10 minutes. I was the guy in the corner listening to the vinyl, all of them, all the way through before I was like, right, that one's coming home and that one's coming home. Here's the other 28. I'm only taking these two, right? But I could never get my head around these people that went into the record shop, just went duh, 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 and walked out with 10 of them because I was like, how do you know that those are good tracks just from going duh, 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 duh. Anyway, those DJs, they're not around anymore. <laughs> They've gone. <laughs> It was like having your own record store selector, right? Who was curating for you right. the best of what they right. were getting in and giving it to exactly. you. Exactly. So it was like a sieve, you know, and it was like, and then, but, but now in this modern age, there is no sieve. You are the only sieve, right? The, the, which makes the, the detail. Yeah, although, although, you know, depending on who you're getting stuff from, or you can use your record pools, or, you know, there yeah. are sources that yeah. you use as a yeah. sieve, and, you know, yeah. you're sort of... Yeah doing yes. some kind of filtering in that way there is the, the filtering of the promo agencies and the record pools that's yeah that, that that's helpful um but you know there is there is also a lot to be said for just trawling through beatport you know going into a genre okay forget the top 100 forget the top 10 go into the a genre that you like and just go through every single track and spend an afternoon on it and you know I, I would challenge any new DJ or any to do that, right? Because that is, that is a, that's a, like an art, you know, that is, that's kind of, you know. And so you really so you're, sort of, you're sort of saying that's the, that's the digital equivalent of walking into the record store, putting the headphones on and just going through a bunch of uh, vinyl, mm -hmm. right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, 100%, 100%. I love it. Okay, so, um, and obviously all the tracks that you produce yourself or where people have remixed uh, or you've been sent them directly, you're going to have uh, in, in you know, digital form already. Any tracks that you uh, want to buy, where are you generally buying those from, Beatport or Juno or that sort of thing? Bandcamp. Bank, I'm, a, I'm a Bandcamp supporter. If I can get a track from Bandcamp, you know, as an independent artist, I will download from Bandcamp. Um if it's not on Bandcamp, and Bandcamp can be a little bit annoying with its search facility, then Beatport. Um, and I've also mentioned Juno. I, I, I will buy from Juno too. Um, yeah. And so, uh, so you're collecting all your tracks, and then how are you building your 
uh, playlists in Recordbox or which DJ software do you use? Are you Windows or Mac? I can't remember. Well, I'm Mac. I'm Mac based. And before it gets onto any um, playlist, it, I, I, I have a, a system where I write down the track names in Notepad on, on Mac Notepad. So I have uh, lists of tracks, um, mainly in month order, um, and 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 yeah, and they're full of full of track names. And sometimes I've got notes in there about the release as well, and the artists involved, and where they're from, and what they've been up to. You know, uh, yeah. And and this is why the the dark album remixes are. Um, are so exciting because you know there's been extensive connections made with artists and so that that means they know that they're making a remix for someone who is not just passionate about their own music but also passionate about their music and i think that makes a big difference in terms of inspiring an artist to to remix a track right um, yeah so but you, uh, so you um yeah, go on. Essentially, step one it's 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 in it's in Notepad on on a Mac, and then uh, then I'll uh, I'm I'm still using an old version of iTunes, which um, which allows me to build playlists in iTunes, um, and um, and then once it makes it into a playlist in iTunes, it then gets refined further into a kind of um, so there'll be like a big pool of tracks in iTunes, which are tracks I like and are acceptable for my high standards. <laughs> but then they get refined further. So there's something called The Cut. I, I call it The Cut. And The Cut are tracks that have made it from the larger pool into a more refined pool. And then they'll go from there into record box. And, and, that's, and, then, and then I'll drag them out of the iTunes folder in record box into an official record box playlist so by the time it gets into record box it's made the cut yes yeah. uh just so going back in, to your nothing in my record box which i would be dubious to play right it's like the stuff that's in there is yeah yeah so if you're stuck at a gig and you've got your usb uh, you know that whatever you're going to play from there, you're going to be happy. I mean, obviously, depending on the genre and the, the vibe and everything, yeah, but, yeah. but it's yeah, all mean, pretty... It's, yeah, there, there's, there, there's a story of where I got... Um, I played at Sisyphus in Berlin, and they booked me last minute, and I didn't have anything like Mixo, and all I had was my iPad and my USBs. So I had I had all my kind of generic playlists in on my USBs, and I can tell you a bit more about how I how I order my tracks in my kind of playlists there. But um, yeah, literally, I just spent a few hours with my iPad going through my notebook playlists and building a, a playlist in a in a notepad on on my iPad. And I then had my iPad with me at the gig. And if I got stuck for a track, I'll just scroll through this. Uh, list of tracks on my on my notepad and literally I knew that every single one of those tracks was perfect for for a kind of uh, dark Berlin techno set you know it's like but a lot of the time when I'm playing a set um, literally the track names just come into my head I'll just I'll, so, so I'll have a playlist that I'll have created for that gig but that will just act as a kind of uh, cornerstone or foundation and you know once once I'm following a feeling and I'm working with the people in the room and I'm seeing where the energy is going then track names will just drop into my mind and I'll just use the search function on the CDJs to to pull out the track um, only very occasionally will I trawl through a, a list a playlist on on the I mean you, you you will see me trawling through right but a lot of the time it's just name, search function, there. And that's why with the 2000s and the 3000s, it's so much easier to work with than the old search function and like some of the older CDJs was really painful. 
Yeah. So are you uh, are you backing up your Apple Notes with your entire lifetime's DJ uh, music history? Man, my relationship with Apple is very interesting. I hated Apple for a long time because I, coming from the kind of rebellious techno family, Apple represented to me a um, kind of dark uh, uh, corporate force. And, you know, I used to build my own computers to write techno on. And, and then what happened is I really wanted to write music on touchscreen devices. I, I you know, t- mobile, touchscreen mobile phones were coming in. The iPhone had just been launched. I was reading in Computer Music Mag about um, drum machines, touchscreen drum machines, that sort of thing. And I was like, man, I really want to get on with this. I tried everything to avoid Apple. I went to Android. I tried getting drum machines on Android devices. I wanted to stick with PCs and Android. But Android wasn't made for creatives. Android was made for consumers. So the way that the operating system was built, they couldn't make touchscreen drum machines that would work properly on it. So literally, I kind of just gripped my teeth and I was like, right, I'm going to buy an iPad. You know, I hadn't bought an iPhone. I'm going to buy an iPad to write techno on. And I did it. I got an iPad mini. It was probably about 2012, 2013, something like that. And then it was like an arranged marriage after that. I was like, okay, right, iPad okay, well now I can write music on my iPhone. I'll get an iPhone, I can write music on my... So, like, a lot of this Dark album, I wrote, like, the some of the bits of it on my iPhone, right? Like, so then, then I was like, right, okay, get an iMac, because it all talks through the iCloud. And so then it's like, yeah, so when, when you say everything's backed up on, note, on Notepad, yeah, everything's in the cloud, right? It's on my phone, it's on my iPad, it's on my Mac. Um, even my music projects, I use a system called Korg, gadget and that backs everything up to the iCloud so I can pick up a project on my iPhone I can then pick up the same project on my iPad I can then come home from a gig you know write write music on the train on the way home and then come home and sit down at my Mac and the same project will come up on my Mac so I am yeah I'm completely sold to Apple now (laughs) there you go that's that's the creative journey and you've had, and so you've got all that backed up. And I, lo- I just love the the sort of um, the old school feel of keeping everything in Notepad. I mean, you've got to keep it somewhere, right? And uh, but it's an interesting thing because the DJ software sort of doesn't have, you know, you've got notes for each track, but you don't have a sort of wider notes or what you're doing, or you know, there's no Google Docs for your DJ software sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, the only thing that I could do that would be more basic than writing it in the notepad would be to have a, a, a diary, right, where I've written them, written it down in hand. <laughs> that would be the only, the only other way of backing it up even further. But in, yeah, in the yeah, middle yeah. of your in the middle of your gig, thumbing through your through <laughs> your notebook with your with your uh, fountain pen, writing notes on which tracks are playing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I went to see John Talibut play recently, and I could imagine him doing something like that, right? I mean, he, he is an incredible uh, creative force. And, um, yeah, there, I mean, there is something beautiful about um, about the, the creative energy. Um, but, no, I am fully sold to digital, although I do have a journal. I do, ha- and I would encourage anyone who is on a on a journey to to keep a journal because it's um, it's a it's an important well it's um, it's fascinating you know stuff that I've written in my journal years ago I then read it now and I'll be like whoa I kind of thought I put an intention for that to happen five years ago and now it's actually happening you know so keeping a journal is a fascinating thing. I I agree. I agree completely. Okay, cool. So, um, uh, so we got into your DJ software through the cut, the the tracks that uh, make it all the way through, and you use Recordbox, right? And then you'll export to your USB. I think you were going to tell us how you uh, organise your playlist in Recordbox. Okay, okay. So I'm going to be really controversial now because you know, being an old school DJ who used to play on vinyl. Okay, 
and then now hanging out with quite a lot of new school DJs who have even been to like DJ college and um, various things like that, right? And I look at their playlists and they, they think they, they start with like the BPM and then after the BPM, so they've actually named their tracks like, and they start with a BPM and then after that they have like a key, they've written the key and then after that it says the track name. Um, I, I look at it and I'm just like, I mean... I mean like what like you know so you're now going through choosing your music based on its bpm and its key and it's like so wait so just 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 to clarify because i know lots of people do that in their sort of tags and in the dj software but you're saying this is in terms of the actual file name the physical digital file yeah i've seen i've seen i've seen I've, I've, i've been to gigs and i've seen djs that have actually renamed their tracks so first of all it says the, the BPM, and then it has the key. I've got nothing against that, right? I've got nothing against choosing a track based on its BPM and its key. But for me, that isn't how I DJ, right? It's purely based on feeling and intuition. And so the way I structure my folders are with uh, names that about the feeling of the track. So I'll have like... <laughs> Of course you do. Of course you do, Ross. I, I mean, I could have predicted that. I love it. Tell us more. I mean, it's quite, it's quite binary, though. So it's, I, I, don't, I don't go into, much, into a great deal of depth, but I have, like, hard, dark, or um, medium, light, vocal, or <laughs> lighter than air, vocal, Right. And and so if I get stuck, then I'll be like, right, what's going on in the room? OK, well, we've just had a really dark track and the energies. And now I just want to uplift everyone. So I'm going to go into my hard uplifting folder. Oh, do we really want to send people into heaven? Right. We'll go hard uplifting vocal. Right. And then it's like, OK, yeah, this really is. You know, that, that, that's how I do it. And. You know, and I don't mix in key, you know, I'm, I, I, I mix some feeling. So if there's a feeling in one track and then there's a feeling in another track and something inside me, this voice in my head says, you know, this track, I'll play it. I, I, I won't care whether one's in B flat and the other's in F sharp. You know, it's like, right, I know there's a sound in that track that connects with a sound in that other track. And those two tracks need to be together right now. And I'm going to do it. It would be, it would be fascinating, actually, to, if you could analyse all of what you played to see how much of it actually was in key, because that right. feeling... Wasn't it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 is, that is something that could possibly be done by someone who's got some time. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a guy I talk to who categorizes everything in um, his DJ software by key, but he, when he listens to the track, he um, tags the key by ear. So he doesn't use the key detection. Beautiful. It, Beautiful. Yes. Yes. Yeah. There's so much to be said for atonal as well, which, you know, is, uh, te- you know, techno, atonal with techno. Wow. You know, uh, and bells, right? Uh, a lot of techno has bells, uh, bell sounds, and um, uh, especially hypnotic techno. Um, and you know, just the bell sound in itself is dissonant, right? Um, so yeah, atonal dissonance. You know, that's kind of my territory. Um, but all of that said, it's. If you were to come to hear me play a DJ set, it wouldn't all be atonal dissonance, right? It would be, it, we, we would work together to go to different places. That would be, that would be what to expect. And, you know, that's, yeah. Yeah. And to go to the hard uplifting vocal places. <laughs> Man, I really, I do really love some hard uplifting vocal tracks. Um, and at, at, at the end of a set, right? If we've like, if we just did a really good party here in in Brighton, yeah, um, on Valentine's, and um, you know, I went 
into some very dark, complex techno, which was great to take a Brighton crowd into a very dark, complex techno set. But then I, I finished with um, uh, Fortet, um, Easy Lover, um, you know, with uh, what's her name? Yeah. And then after that, just, you know, to go one step further, Eliza Rose, uh, the baddest of them all, uh, which which was like a bit of a an anthem last year. But, you know, it's like, it's, it is that release, you know, when we've gone into that really dark, intense place, the lights go on in the venue, everyone can see one another's faces, and then, you know, some beautiful track like that, it's, it's you know, it's just golden to me. It's just... It's sort of about sending everybody on their way, a, a sort of closure in some way. Absolutely. And, and, you know, that little vocal in their mind as well as they get their cabs home or to the after party and they've got, she's the baddest of them all. She's the baddest of them all. <laughs> it's, like, it's just like a little earworm that will, that will remind them of the party, you know. It's, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then um, and then uh, at the end, you know, you've got everything in record books. Are you, you're exporting to USB and mostly playing in clubs with your USB. I think you you've got a controller as well, maybe. I work with Denon and Pioneer. Um, yeah, so at home I got Denon and Pioneer, and um, but I again I I I guess just to come back to the very basic um, fundamentals of how I DJ. And this, this is no, this is first thing first, um, people should do their own thing, right? Like I wouldn't be interested in anyone copying my style of DJing because that would be pointless, right? As soon as someone is doing that, they might as well give up and go home because AI is going to be able to copy another DJ far better than them. So, you know, in five, 10 years time, you'll be able to say to an AI, play me a Richie Horton style techno set, and it will do it far better than anyone else who's trying to copy Richie Horton. So the first thing is do your own thing, right? Like if you're going to be a DJ, do your own thing. But I can't even remember your question now. Um, but yeah. Oh, do, so do you're, your you're, yeah, yeah you're, well, it's a, it's a very important life lesson as well as DJ lesson, so I'm happy to hang out there. But I was asking you about uh, exporting to USB and then playing right. at clubs and whether you yeah. use a controller and that kind of stuff. Thank you. Yeah, so, so the fundamental for me is, um, is actually just about mixing one track into another and track selection. And so, again, I, spe- I suppose it comes from being a, a 90s vinyl DJ, you know, where literally you would just be going from one deck to the next, um, so actually the, the software, the, you know, as long as I know how to, uh, press play, bring up a loop, you know, that's, you know, that's, that, that for me is the, 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 ba- you know, the basics that's needed to, to play a, a set, right. That's going to be, um, yeah, that's going to, that's going to be satisfying for me. Um, and I am self-indulgent in that sense you know like um I, I i need to play music that i appreciate yeah and um uh so uh so when you're playing out uh you're also just coming back to your uh apple notes you're actually keeping notes of the tracks that you play yeah so the, the process is reversed yeah now this is where technology is so beautiful so you know pioneer um will bring up your histories log on record box so then copy and paste that out into notepad delete all the junk out of it and yeah so i then keep i then keep records of every set actually 95 percent of the sets i play or or a large majority of them are on my website under the track list section and if if it's recorded there'll either be a youtube link or a SoundCloud link if it's not recorded then it'll just be giving credit to the artist right and you know I think that's super important and I know like Richie Horton who's someone I mentioned a few times and someone I really look up to he uses something called a slice uh, which is developed by DVS one uh, the techno pioneer and this is software where an, a DJ can 
log all of the tracks they've played in a set and give part of their DJ fee to A Slice and A Slice will then divvy up that chunk to all of the producers that have helped that DJ put that set out. So I don't personally do that. I'm not in that place right now, but I fully respect um, uh, Richie Horton and uh, you know that you know that is that is why keeping all of these notes fastidiously is so important and putting it on uh, my website and you know it's um, just feels right to me to do that and it is hard work but it feels right to do it yeah nice okay well um to uh to wrap up uh, you've given us a few wonderful pearls of wisdom as always ross uh, what uh, what's your advice for young DJs getting started now in a world that is very different than it was when you started? That's such a good question. That's such a good question. <sighs> okay, and I know the answer. I know the the answer is to. We're on to the level. Lock you in? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, the the answer is to listen. To listen to the tracks, yeah, to listen to lots and lots of music. That is the answer. And um, and then actually I don't think, I don't think a DJ can go wrong, right? If they have invested enough time in listening to the music that they want to play, then I don't, I, I, I think then, I think then as long as they then um, can have the confidence to go to promoters and venues and say, I really love music. I want to play some music for you and just keep on doing that. Right. So listen to lots and lots of music, really connect with the stuff that you love and then take that love and go to promoters and venues to share that. Right. I think, I think that is it. Right. But there's going to be so much other junk that gets thrown at you from every single angle. And there's going to be so much social media froth that is going to uh, kind of distract you. And But yeah, just go back to those foundational principles. Wonderful. I love it. Thanks so much for your time, Ross. I'll see you in, uh, in a techno club in Brighton very soon. Yes, yes, and or, 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 or coffee, or both, coffee and techno. <laughs> I look forward to it, my friend. All right, nice one. All right. Thanks, Take dude. Thanks. Bye. Awesome. <laughs> oh, that was fun. Okay, hold yeah. on, let me just... Thank you, do... thank you. Me you got, thank you, you. you. You know, second time round, we got even further, we got even deeper into some... <laughs> and we sort of knew where we were going as well, right? right.